So um, I'd like to bring up Harley and Michael to the couch, please, if you guys would come sit up front. And then I'm going to bring up the other uh, founders who are with us uh, and introduce them. And if they would come up one by one as I introduce you and, and come sit, that would be great. So Michael, if you want to take your place, that would be great. Um, Will Roger Peterson was the original founder and manager of Black Rock City's Department of Public Works, also known as DPW. If you want to see some of the toughest, most interesting people at Burning Man, DPW is where you go and look. Uh, Will moved to Gerlach, um, and he's deeply involved in conservation efforts for the Black Rock Desert. So Will is part of this leading edge, if you will, of Burning Man, not just coming to be an event that takes place on the playa every year, but now is more and more part of Reno and Gerlach and our region on a permanent basis. Will's an accomplished photographer um, who worked for nearly 20 years at the Rochester Institute of Technology in New York. Uh, if you talk about the new topographic photographers and that era, um, Will has had a foot in that as well. Um, so he's, he's like many of the founders who've had many roles with the organization, but other roles in life itself. Crimson Rose uh, is Will's partner. Uh, she began and, and she began participating in Burning Man in 1991. I believe, Rose Crimson, you're the person responsible, actually, for getting Will out to the pie, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, she developed the uh, organization's art department. I first went to uh, Burning Man in 1992. There was no art department. It was the first year, though, they really invited artists to come participate. You saw the one slide of the, the, the Wicker Women. Uh, that was one of several projects that year. So Crimson Rose has really seen a lot of change uh, in the art department. But also, um, she's worked on infrastructure and financial and other support services that make the large-scale participatory artworks possible. She's long been involved in fire arts, the fire conclave, in fire safety, and pyrotechnics in Black Rock City. Uh, and you saw her photograph uh, and her beautiful dress uh, as she was climbing up on the, on the, the man uh, in the exhibition upstairs. Marion Goodell is in the back, and she's going to come... Ah, there she is. Okay, thank you. She's sneaking up on the side. Um, so Marion's one of these people who's had many, many roles uh, with Burning Man. Um, she's been director of business and communications. She's overseen the DPW. She's uh, steered the department of the development of Burning Man's regional network, which now has, you know, 300 people plus in 35 countries on six continents. Um, and she is and was and remains the first CEO of the Burning Man Project, so the creation of the nonprofit, the 501c3 tax-exempt organization. What I'd like to do is ask, uh, ask the people on the couch a few questions um, and then open up to Q&A. And so I think Brian and uh, Chris can wander off with the microphones when we get to that point. But let me start with just a, just a few questions. Um, so, Marion, I'd like to start with you, if I may. And, um, you know, we, we talked about the fact that, that the organization since 96, since you've been going. Um, I went in 95. She went in 95, thank you. Since 95, since you've been going since 95. The organization has had this explosive growth that Michael sort of indicates in those charts, right, those bar charts. And it's not just the, the growth of Burning Man on the playa, it's also the spread of its ethos, if you will, around the world. And if you could talk just a little bit about that, please. Sure. Um, my role, I think, uh, the creation of the CEO role came as we went from an LLC to create the nonprofit. And the purpose, certainly, for the nonprofit is to take the values and the experience of what has happened through Black Rock City, the cultural output, and to take it out to the world. Um, my first engagement with that was in 1997, when we were on the Wallapai Playa, on the edge, as Michael pointed out. And when we, we had an a interesting relationship with Washoe County at that time, Bill. They didn't really like us as well as you all like us now. <laughs> and uh, the county had levied uh, some fees for fire protection on us that basically left us in debt. So as we left uh, the area in uh, September, October of 1997, we were $200,000 in debt. But what happened that we really hadn't expected was the Burning Man diaspora, the individuals that were out in the world and the internet was just starting to come to life, they, they started to contact us asking how they could help us get out of debt. 
And that was the beginning of what was, that was the seed of what then enabled the, what we call the regional network to grow. And of course, Michael made reference to the Burners Without Borders, and that also came organically out of the Hurricane Katrina. And those two areas, along with the work that we're doing, um, the, at the time it was the Black Rock Arts Foundation uh, that was helping bring art to, uh, there was the art, the, there was civic arts, but then there was also the art, uh, the art grants. So all of that together, as we started to develop the nonprofit mission, it became clear that we had more than just the event that we were able to articulate a story that was gonna help us take the culture out to the world. And as we looked at how we were going to move all of that forward, uh, we worked for I think a couple of years to really sort of look at the architecture and the, the bylaws and the governance. And uh, I kind of joke and say that I got the short straw. Um, <laughs> we, uh, it, it was sort of my turn at that point. And we hadn't really had anybody in this um, point position and um, not only do I do governance, of course, but I do a lot of work speaking out into the world. Um, and I help um, Teresa from our development department uh, map our great network together so that we can continue to create opportunities for people to engage with us in different ways. Mary, and kind of a follow-up question to that. When I talk about you all as founders having had different roles within the organization, it's my outside impression that you have people in the office who have been with you for a long time and they take up different roles over time as they work with the organization. Is that a correct perception or? Somewhat. We've had, yeah, I think that that is, particularly the ones that have been with us longer. Um, as you noted, we each had our own skill set in the world and it was kind of typical for us to take on what we knew or were comfortable with. And then sometimes over time, things shifted and we needed to take on something else. And certainly the, at least the first 25 employees that we had with us did a bit of the same. It's been a, an evolutionary process, uh, the, the growth and development of Burning Man, both uh, in the organization and within the people in the organization. Uh, there would be a need for something to happen and someone would step into that role and pretty soon it would become a whole department. So it, it's an evolutionary process. It's worked very well. And it, and it continues to evolve. That's how when maybe a need changes or the interest would change and we modify as we go. That's one of the most exciting things I think about Burning Man is, to, um, is that we're still organic. Um, you know, we, we, we'll sit still and we'll architect something and then the winds of change uh, in society or the government or our own needs to change the culture um, and we'll, we'll move and modify things. So it's not just the physical structure of Burning Man that's iterative, that, tra that changes over time. It's actually the, the personnel and the management structure and everything. Will, I want to ask you about moving to Gerlach, about the relationship of Burning Man to the town of Gerlach and the Empire. And I also want to ask you about the relationship of Burning Man to the Paiute Reservation. So there's a couple of questions there. Moving to Gerlach, relationship to the town, and then to the reservation. Uh, be before I go into that, uh, I just want to add something to what we were just talking about. And, and that is that there, there's, there's five of us uh, here. There's six of us, really. We're missing Larry, and I apologize for that. Um, we all have separate skill sets that came together at exactly the right time. And all six of us have a can-do yes, we're going to do this attitude, which is not always found in business. We don't look at what might get in our way. We just go around it. <laughs> and, and, and that's how we became successful. OK, so I'm going to tell a story about Gerlach and, and my relationship to it. I live in Gerlach right now. It's a town of 120 people uh, on the edge of nowhere. And, and um, I, I love it, um, but it didn't start that way. Um, I had a photo studio in Oakland, and I met Crimson. She was my model and my muse. And she said, you got to come to this thing in the desert. And I said, no way. I don't want to go to the desert. She gets me to go to the desert. I injure my feet right away. I'm laying back in one of the first theme camps, and I go, oh my goodness, there's mountains. There's like a whole wilderness around me. 
And I was an avid backpacker, so I decided that I would invest in, in uh, exploring the wilderness there, and I fell in love. So, so Burning Man brought me to the desert, but then I fell in love with the much greater thing that's up there, and that's truly changed my life. So I'm very much involved. You asked me how Burning Man affects Gerlach, and really that's an interesting one, because Gerlach is a, a small town with very little infrastructure. When I first moved up there, there were five bars and no churches, and 120 people. I mean, it, the math doesn't work out. <laughs> so you would have to drink in each of the five bars every night just to keep the, the places going. So anyway, that's what happened. It was a very interesting place. And, um, and then when Burning Man people showed up, well, we populated the bars pretty good every night. You know, I mean, that, that was part of the culture. Um, but Burning Man is just a seasonal event. So, so we, our impact on Gerlach is, is like this, if you did a bell curve of it, it would be like, like that. It would be straight up and straight flat again because a month before Burning Man, we bring in a, you know, about two, 300 people and they frequent uh, you know, the different vendors in town. There's not very many. Um, and then after the event, after another month, we leave and the town goes back to this sleepy little desert town, which is really what it is. So the impact has been difficult. It, it, it's, it's trying for the, the, the old residents of the town to comprehend this incredible influx of culture because they moved there to get away from culture. You know, the, uh, and I'm proud to be a Gerlachian. I'm, I feel like I'm a rugged individualist who has rejected culture as we know it. And, and there's reasons for that. It's very logical for me. Um, on the other hand, now as we've evolved over 25 years of being in Gerlach, uh, now some of our former staff and some of our staff have moved in to town. We put a piece of artwork up in, in a, a lot that, that we own in, on Main Street. And, and at first, that was kind of rejected by the town. Now it's embraced. I see families um, having like reunion photos taken underneath it, which is kind of remarkable. So, so we have had an effect. We've had a, a positive effect, I think, finally. And the future of having a positive effect is really big. As Michael pointed out, we now own a, a five square mile property, which has an incredible natural resource on it, a, 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 a travertine geyser that is actually world renowned in some ways. In a, in a, in, and I think as we begin to have visitations to that property and we can bring people into the Gerlach area on a year round basis, I think at that point, the town of Gerlach will begin to thrive. And, and uh, my own dream for it is that um, maybe Gerlach could become the Western Marfa, Texas. <laughs> I mean, that's really w the dream that I have. Mm -hmm. And it's why I moved there. Uh, Crimson and I uh, spend a lot of time up in Gerlach now, and it, it, we, we just love it. And a, and a lot of it is that the desert has an extremeness to it that is powerful and it changes the way you think. It changes your spirit, there's magic in it. It's interesting that a lot of the great uh, philosophies and, and uh, religious uh, uh, philosophies have come from the desert. And so the Great Basin Desert is one of those magic places and Gerlach is the little sleepy town right in the middle of it. I'll come back. I'll come back to the the relationship with the reservation. Let me ask Crimson, though. I mean, so Crimson, um, one of the changes we've we've observed and talked about and seen and participated in has been the change in the way art functions within the culture of Burning Man. Could you just talk about that for a little bit? Oh boy, the art on the playa. Um, I believe that we have worked with the artists for many years. Uh, the Black Rock Desert is this barren, harsh environment. It is the most amazing uh, schooling for any artist. If they can do it on the Black Rock Desert, they could do it in a city uh, setting. 
um, working with the artist over the years, uh, not only did they teach us, we taught them, we worked together, sort of a push and pull. And it's so amazing about the creative spirit that the artists have. And there's, I can only think of one piece of artwork that wasn't successful. Even if somebody didn't quite succeed with their vision, the fact that they tried to do it was important. And in the beginning, it, it really was about temporality. We, we never expected to go beyond the one week in the desert. But what was happening with the, net, with the network and everything, that it was going out into the world. And for a long time there, it was, it was really breaking my heart because the artists would take their artwork back home into their studios and either have to destroy it or cannibalize it to make other artwork because they had no room. But now the potential of the artwork is that going out into the world, to universities, to cities. Um, there's a piece by Kate Rottenbush right in front of the museum that was at Burning Man now. Um, so it's really exciting. It, it changes, the art changes from what happens in Black Rock City compared to what happens in a city setting. Certainly, it is the human element that completes the artwork. There are no velvet ropes. There is no barricade between you and experiencing the artwork. In fact, it's the human nature that actually completes the artwork. And introducing that aspect into a city setting has been the most challenging aspect. Um, allowing people to climb a work of artwork out in a city setting is, still makes them really nervous because they always think they're going to get sued. Where we always believe that you know you take care of yourself, you take responsibility for yourself, and even responsibility for hurting yourself if you wanted to. But is that aspect of the human nature and the human touch to be able to be a part of the artwork that, that is now starting to reach really out into the world. And just as Anne was talking about the exhibit upstairs that go to the Renwick, um, that's exciting. That means more audiences that would never go to the Black Rock Desert because it's just not their thing will now be able to see this artwork within their own cities and hopefully no barricades as well. Just kind of a general question um, for any of you. What's it like to be running a radical organization based on ephemerality, if you will, and nomadic, having a nomadic existence, and you're in four museum shows in a, like a 12-month period? That must be... Well, I have to tell you that seeing ourselves in glass cases upstairs is kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> We're still alive. We are. <laughs> It's, ex it's exciting. I feel like, you know, it, you must agree with me that, that it feels like it's the recognition that we're not just the dirty hippies in, the, in the, the desert. There's actually more substance to there. There's more community to it. Well, and thank God that Michael's a magpie and collects everything he comes across. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. No, Michael, I, I, you know, that's, it really is kind of surreal to be... Uh, in the museum show, and then the fact that the show's moving, and it was Norfolk. Um, but I am glad that we can also have a chance to have a dialogue with people about it, that it's just not after our lifetime getting recognized for something cultural, and it is inspirational. Um, when I was here to do my little film festival, um, and then went upstairs while other people were walking through the show, it was really kind of cool to be a little bug on the wall and watch people uh, sort of say, oh, and did you see this? And sit down and watch the little film and um, and get the feeling that the, that the story can reach other people. You don't have to just go to Burning Man in Black Rock City and you can get a, a, a piece of the idea. And for some people, they've had enough experience in creativity and in the environment and in self-expression to actually that it, it um, reminds them of the possibility of the scale of what we're doing. This is not sort of one-off, but we're actually doing this at a scale. Yeah, I mean, people actually still come up to us and say, oh, you mean you have an office or you have employees or you don't, like, it doesn't just take a couple of weeks to do that thing? So having the show here gives people the, uh, the opportunity to see the breadth of what we're doing and understand the scope and the scale. 
Well, we're very excited with the Smithsonian exhibition, which will be a different, larger exhibition than this one. We'll be kind of the front door, the, the history, the story of the organization, but to have them involve the artists, to do projects. I'm very curious, personally, to be on the mall and think about, okay, how does the existing power structure in town look at this exhibition? That's going to be pretty interesting. So, Well, we'll, we'll see the first of that because of uh, the cathexis, uh, catharsis. catharsis. It was Catharsis one year, but it's Catharsis this year, something like that. The Washington, D.C. burners are putting up a Burning Man art piece in November. Um, revolution, terrific. Margot Cochran's Revolution. The one that, the one that actually breathes, breathes. So, Michael, just as, as uh, Will and Crimson have moved to Gerlach, you and Dusty have moved here to Reno. Yes, well, I've been coming to Reno for decades, back in the old days when it was just a gambling town. But... Uh, Reno is the closest metropolitan area to Burning Man. And I think Burning Man has affected Reno so much that it's really important to be here. And Reno is in a process of reinventing itself right now. And I think it's a very exciting place to be because of that. And so that's why we're here. We talk, we're going to be talking uh, with Rem Kulhaus tomorrow about the Tahoe Regional in Industrial Center. and I. I have this kind of story in my head, maybe apocryphal, but the reason Apple moves out there and then the reason Elon Musk and all these characters move out to that part of our state is because they were driving by it on the way to Burning Man and they knew where it was. So they actually, I, I, you know, that's, yeah. Yeah, my early career was in Silicon Valley, uh, developing robotic systems and uh, other things. And of course, when I started coming to Burning Man, I invited all my friends. So I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> Well, let me go back to the question about the relationship between Burning Man and the Paiute Reservation and the Native peoples. Um, my, uh, my responsibility since the beginning was always to get the permit, okay? And uh, there's always challenges with that. And one of the things that the BLM requires of a commercial event on public lands is that they have a contract with the, the local um, indigenous people. Uh, in this case, it would be the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe and the Summit Lake Paiute tribe. And so in order to get that, I would have to um, go to, they have a, uh, the Pyramid Lake tribe has a monthly meeting and, uh, and they only meet once a month. So if something gets carried over, it goes to the next monthly meeting. And so that means my timing had to be good every year. Uh, we had to make sure that, uh, that they were in, in agreement uh, with our use of, of the public lands. And then over the years, that caused me to develop relationships with, with uh, the, uh, the Pyramid uh, Lake Tribe and the Summit Lake Tribe. And then they would invite me to, I've been to a, a couple of their ceremonies, I've heard their language spoke, uh, I've had uh, dinner with the elders. And I think they always, I think even to this day they ask for the the white bearded guy. <laughs> so I, I think they see me as a as a tribal elder in a certain way, and they and they they they, they like to talk to me. So uh, I I've declined the last couple of years. I'm trying to retire from that stuff. I no longer do the permitting, um, but I still have some friends uh, uh, with the Paiute tribe and the Summit Lake tribe. Mm, terrific. Yeah. Well, I'd like to open this up to, to um, a Q and A with everyone, so if we could get microphones going around. I cannot see you, so if we could have the house lights up, that would help, that would be good. Bill, as they're turning the lights up, um, I did want to make note of the fact that it is great to see Bruce Sterling here at your conference, because uh, there he is, right there in the corner. Um, Bruce, I think I've told you this before, but I have to bring it up again, because my first role with Burning Man was um, I had worked in public relations, and uh, my predecessors, when I started dating Larry in late 1996, um, had all sort of vaporized because the group was all having the warring that Michael made reference to. And I knew enough about public relations so that when Larry said, oh, you know, somebody's going to interview him for something, it was post-96 and we were, there was an energy that was happening. And at that time, I had gone to the library and I had found, between 95 and 96, I found two articles about Burning Man. One was in the Village Voice and one was an outside magazine. And I had found both of those articles on microfiche, ladies and gentlemen, okay? 
I'm not kidding. And I had, and I went to the San Francisco Public Library, and they also had um, the internet, but the, there was no photos. It was the, I could go to the web, and there was just words, and there was an interview. And so when Larry said to me, and I was also in the in the tech industry at the time, and, and when Larry said to me, oh, I, 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 I've been in, like, Wired Magazine's gonna do it? I was like, Wired Magazine? Wired Magazine was like the cosmo of the tech world, you know, it was the thing. And he said, yeah, I think they're doing a cover story. I was like, no, you're kidding, no. Wait, no, seriously, that's gonna change everything. And he said, yeah, yeah, it's Wired Magazine, and I think they're also doing a book, too. And there's a, there's a, there's a writer, this writer, I think it's, yes, Bruce Sterling. And I was like, oh my God. So I just want to say that still to this day, I was in Switzerland earlier this year for a conference, and a gentleman came to me, and he said that he was finally going to come to Burning Man this year, and he was in his 40s, and he said the first time he heard about Burning Man was in Wired Magazine in 1996, Bruce Sterling. Your article, which was called The New American Holiday, and you can, you can find it archived, it is a fabulous story by Bruce, and it, it um, sparked um, an energy in the tech community that we still is still part of the thread uh, in the Burning Man culture today. Uh, the technology, the technologists that redwired, they were all working on the edge of the new ideas. It was a new generation of people in San Francisco. It was popping up in New York and Austin. Um, but Bruce uh, struck everybody's imagination, and that certainly has a lot to do with um, why we saw a wave of the tech community come to Burning Man that are still now very involved. And I brought that up because you did just mention Elon. Um, and uh, the Google Doodle, I'll bet some of you don't know, but certainly we do, was started in 1997 when Sergey and Larry were still just a twosome and they were working out of their garage and were coming to Burning Man. And so to let their friends know they'd gone to Burning Man, they used the word Google and the little Burning Man symbol and that's the beginning of the Google Doodle. So um, with Bruce's uh, assistance and certainly with the fandom from people like Sergey and um, Elon, uh, the technology and Burning Man have a really strong and really important relationship. So Bruce, thank you. Terrific. And I think the idea of participant created content is, is one that's caught on with a lot of other people. Okay. Questions? Yes. I have one from one of our educators watching okay. this in the founder's room. Thanks, Amanda. Um, yes, that's Amanda Horn. Uh, but this is not my question. I am the messenger. Um, so most cities do experience gentrification, and Burning Man is a city. Mm -hmm. To what extent are you, if at all, uh, seeing gentrification in the desert the way that we see it in our cities? <laughs> I think Michael commented a little bit about this. Well, the question is, are, you, are we seeing gentrification at Burning Man? That's right. And if so, how? Well, I guess the uh, gentrification can be a matter of perspective. That seems to be a, a typical question, at least when I've been speaking recently, and people perceive it because of the articles that have indicated that the wealthy are coming to Burning Man and that by some people's opinion that that's ruining Burning Man. Um, I would say that the term gentrification doesn't apply because Burning Man is actually becoming more accessible, accessible to a wider range of people, which is making the experience of being there more interesting. That's just me. These guys might have a different opinion. There, there's also a, a lot of increased support for the art and, and such. It, it, the art is becoming larger and more incredible, and that can be experienced by everyone that's there. So I, th I think there's a certain a contribution that's there with, with people of means. But we're, we're evolving and growing, even with all that. Yeah, I'd say every year I've gone to Burning Man, that's since 1991, it's been different, and it keeps evolving, and this is simply another way that it's evolving. Um, I don't know that gentrification applies. It certainly is changing quite a bit. Um, but one of my secret hopes and dreams has always been that we could change corporate America. So when we have people coming in, and they can only spend three days there, but they're affected, positively, and they go back and start changing their corporations, I think we might have a positive effect going on. You know, um, when you come to Black Rock City, you're in the middle of a desert, which is very magic. And, and after a few days, there is no black or white, there's no race, there's no gender. After the first dust storm, there's just 
10 people. <laughs> you know, maybe the gentrification, I mean, in the beginning, there was no trash fence. There were no established roads. I think maybe that is one way you could call gentrification, that there is a layout to the city that made it easier to navigate. More questions? Right up here in front, yeah. Hi there. I'm, uh, as an artist, I'm, it's, it's clear to me that Burning Man um, is pushing the boundaries of intellectual property. And uh, I know that controls with, with, you know, it's almost become a photo op in some ways. Um, I'm, um, obviously, that must be something that you guys have talked about. Can you give us some insight on, on how you'd like to see that evolve? When you said boardwalk, is that, is that what you just said? No. Um, photo op. Where people came and instead of really participating and being involved, they're, they're more there just to see and to, to capture. Selfie nation, yeah. <laughs> uh, with the uh, development of technology uh, that's, that's pervasive everywhere now, global, uh, that is now a part of what Burning Man is. And uh, certainly, it, it's, it's going to change to somewhat of a degree what Burning Man was, uh, certainly from the early days. But there's been a, a series of steps that have leaps, I would say, in, in the world of art uh, at Burning Man. I remember when I first saw my, uh, when I saw, saw my first uh, LED lights in 1997, there was two women with beautiful dresses with EL wire and rolling across, uh, walking across the playa at night, and it was incredible. And I said, nighttime is going to be an amazing thing at Burning Man. And also the development of art cars. We, we're, we've seen a shift from heavy metal, weighty things to fabric-covered farms. So we've gone from reflected light imagery to art that is now projecting light into our eyes. So the, the technology is shifting, and, and it's, it's, it's amazing in itself what's happening, and it opens new avenue for artists. You know, you know I think the other aspect about, that I've always believed, and Black Rock City allowed the nerds, the freaks, and the geeks to have a place to, all of a sudden, the, the computer whizzes that may have been pushed away by the, the in crowd when they were growing up, all of a sudden, they're the, they're the people that, you know, are helping the artist, just like during those costumes and everything. You asked about intellectual property, though. Did you want Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about the, the controls, right? Because part of what's so beautiful about what happens there is, that you can almost do anything, right? Maybe not help be held accountable for it another time. And as as people come and photograph and do things, it, it changes that. And um, I'm just, and I know that that you guys have kind of have some unique policies about allowing people to to actually t capture imagery and stuff, and then use it for their own uses and stuff after. So, so do you see that loosening up or actually becoming more restrictive as far as allowing well, people to, the, what to do in the outside yeah, at, world. At this point, I, I was just actually ha telling someone this story the other day because that's one of the things that I, when I came around, it existed before me, but um, we set up a camera tagging process in 1997. Everybody that arrived at Burning Man in 1998 and 99 after that, everybody, if you had a camera, you actually took a, an agreement and then you put a tag on your camera. And at the time, it was a practical thing to do. Not everybody brought their camera to Burning Man, and not everybody had a camera, really, at all, to some degree. Um, and the purpose of that was to manage the use of the images on a couple of levels. One, honestly, was that the government continued to insist that we were problematic morally because there was nudity, and that there was a lot of drug use. And so, like, on the one level, it was sort of like, you know, you don't really want people taking a bunch of pictures that are of things that are going to keep, keep you in trouble all the time. That was one angle. The other was, it seemed like a, a reasonable 
protection to offer ourselves um, of asking people not to take photos of others and use them in a way without their permission, and that, that we kind of we looked at it as privacy issues. So for a number of years, uh, we did this process, and then professional photographers filled out a different kind of form, and they would state what they were going to do. But the private photographers, your own camera, you would basically say that you had no commercial use. The other ones, commercial use included a gallery show. It included selling them at a gallery show. Um, and again, these were these were times when there wasn't much in the way of um, even galleries that you could buy on the internet. That all kind of changed as blogging and software to drop, you know, 600 photographs came up and easily tag your photographs and then put them up. And we did, um, as much as even five years ago, police that to a degree so that people weren't selling photos. It's been kind of a bit of a chase at times. But um, we really don't want people capitalizing off the backs of others, whether it's off the backs of, of, of the artists, of individuals, of performers, of the backdrop, of the layout of the city. So we do, to the best of our ability at this point, try to manage the way in which people commodify and sell the imagery. Um, we do require that when people, uh, we try, when people use images in their stories, we'd like to see the artist credited, not just the photographer. And you can see that Michael did that in his slideshow. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, we've started that a long time ago, and then it got drifted away, and then we're just raining that one back in again. We won't even share um, images unless it's clear, and even when we do our own annual report, um, we do an annual um, calendar, and that has a listing of all the photographers, but it also has a listing of all the artists that people took photos of. But the thing that changed the most, of course, was that now everybody has their own camera, and the practicality of policing that, and the act of actually taking we discovered that the act of taking the agreement and putting the tag on, you, you became accountable for the photographs you were taking. And you were more likely to ask permission. And cameras were really, they, they weren't as obtrusive. Now people just pull them up and we can walk up the street and there's somebody taking a picture of something. Um, and so we've had to modify the way that we have that conversation because it's kind of tilting at windmills if we kept saying the same thing all the time. But I have noticed, and this is just me, and the others might have a difference of an opinion, and I know Michael has been watching the imagery and the use of the imagery really closely for a long time. I do think that we created a shell of expectation by that initial um, uh, uh, you know, behavior, that if we had waited until there were 70,000 people and tried to have that talk, that it would have been harder. But because we had that talk when there's 4,000 people, there's 8,000 people, there's 10,000 people, and even we had to tie on the little tags, they would, they would, in the wind, they would blow up against your camera. We got all these complaints from the videographers because it would make this sound on, on the, so we changed the tags. So the tags were like a whole thing. We used to work on the size of the tags, the numbers, the numbers on the tags would match the agreement. I swear to God, we did this. But that helped a psychology that I think does still help now. But Michael, I'm sure you have a thought. It's actually in the culture now that is actually doing more policing than any legal contract we can come up with. As a former photography professor, I, I, um, there's a thing called street shooting, okay? So this is from like 30, 40 years ago. There's a whole genre. And when you're out there shooting through a camera, you're not experiencing the immediacy of the event that's going on. You're looking at it through a camera. So you're creating a degree of separation. I used to accuse my students of, of uh, being protected by the shield of the camera, that they would aim at the reality in front of them. And when reality is really intense, I encourage them not to be photographers. So one of our principles has to do with immediacy. And well, I could apply that philosophy from 30 years ago to today, except today, everybody's on social media walking around with their phones, separating themselves from the immediacy of living life that's in front of them. That, I think, is the real issue here, okay? And that's more, much bigger than Burning Man. It's, it's a worldwide thing, and it's scaring me. So I just wanted to throw that out. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
We have a question over here, yes. Hi there. Maybe um, it might be kind of a good follow-up. Um, I'm wondering to what degree um, in the past, but then also in the future, the art or the more prominent pieces are curated with sort of all the obvious challenges that go with that, that, are, that goes from censorship up. Or, I mean, I think there is some curatorial influence, but I'm not sure what. Is, is, is the art that's out there, is it curated? There's um, over 350 pieces of artwork on, on the average out there, and uh, the percentage of them that are actually given honorarias, which is a curation process, is Crimson will have the numbers better than yeah, me. Yeah, last year we, out of that three, over 300, we gave grants to 70. Uh, I believe when we did our letter of intent, it was over 500 works of art that people applied to get grants. Kept whittling that down. Um, Sometimes it doesn't have to do with the theme, sometimes it does. You know, uh, the biggest aspect for us is, is it interactive? You know, is it speaking to the people more than anything else? And it really runs the gamut. It could be something very silly um, that's just really wonderful to something like the temple that gets funded. Um, and every year, I mean, it's, it's sort of like Christmas when we go through and and look at all the artwork and then it gets really sad because you have to say no to some uh, other artwork. But what happens, if somebody is not gonna get a grant but they're still gonna bring their artwork, we will help them still with tickets and heavy equipment to offload or put up the artwork as well. So there's a lot of support that goes on with that. So the curation's not very great and people are still encouraged to bring their art anyway and we can give some support to help them in that process. Or if they want to be completely independent, they can be. Thanks for, um, so one more thing, I was just curious. Uh, sonically, is there any curating? Like, does anybody show up with a truck and blast a kind of music where you go, no way, that's not here? Because I met this summer, I mean, there's a little car went by with bluegrass music blaring and it was it was kind of like a charming anomaly but it wasn't an anomaly compared to everything yeah, many else. many many years ago we decided not to um, to to judge qu kind of music or quality of music we just judge sound how loud is it if it's too loud we'll ask them to turn it down it's just volume is the only thing that we try to keep any control over and you can tell that's kind of a hard battle as well wouldn't it be great to have some Lawrence Welk out there or some mariachi yeah. music as well <laughs> This, uh, Amanda? Uh, I'm curious how oh, the conversations among yourselves have changed over the years with regards to, um, like there's a, it's an ephemeral um, city, but people are bringing more and more structures into it, which then have to be removed. So is that a discussion about sustainability, resilience, or do you just like say, we're, people are just gonna figure it out, and, and we're gonna take mostly a hands-off approach to that. Is that something you, you discuss, worry about? It's, How's that changed? Um, well, you know, we do have a staff and we do look around for things that might be unsafe. Um, and, and of course that criteria is uh, challenged in many ways. You can look at things and sometimes they look unsafe and they might have been made to look unsafe and they're very safe. On the other hand, there might be some things that look really safe and they're not. So you have to sort of look underneath a little bit. We do have the rangers are trained in that. Um, uh, there's community service people, the DPW. Uh, our staff will, will help us with structures. Um, on the other hand, we have no criteria of what you can build or what you can't build. I don't think there's anything written in anything that we have about uh, our citizens building something. So if you, you know, the idea is to encourage creativity, and, and I think we do that pretty well. If we have an opportunity to catch something before it gets out there, like if it's part of a placement questionnaire, or if it's part of an art project, we'll have conversations with people in advance to do our best to set them up for success. Um, but otherwise, we're living on the edge. <laughs> I think it is about success, you know, and the art department and art support services is really works with the artists to make sure it is safe. That it's that not only somebody climbing on it, but is it going to stand up 
to the wins and participants. And then we also have um, a group of people called Eyes on Art that actually go around the, uh, during the event and are looking for things that are not lit because you want to make sure that nobody's running into your artwork as well. But, but making sure that they're helping the artist all the way through the event. Yeah, if you want to bring a giant statue of King Kong made out of steel, just make sure you take it with you when you leave. <laughs> so we have a question from the Sky Room this time. Um, Michael, in your presentation, you talked a little bit about the plug and play camp culture and said that Burning Man is working to um, help kind of fix that. Would you mind elaborating on some of the measures that Burning Man is putting into place to deal with the plug and play camp culture? Um, we have a new department that we've developed. It's called Outside Services. And um, that's a method of um, having a dialogue, having a relationship with the vendors that are coming in to support those camps. So that's our first line of attack is to um, is to have, again, vendors come in and, and understand who we are and what we're doing and operate within our principles in a way that's culturally appropriate to our event um, and for us to keep sort of tabs on where they're going and what they're doing and what are the good vendors from the bad vendors. And, that, and through that, we can then have conversations with the camps themselves. Um, we have, uh, of course, dialogue with camps um, annually and we pick up those conversations right after the event. We do an evaluative process through the event and then start our conversations afterwards. So we're in constant dialogue with um, as many camps as we need to be at Burning Man. Um, and we, we're doing a lot just to support the culture overall. We, we've always done this. We know that it takes um, a, a really strong communication campaign to get messages out to people. And we take a real broad stroke when we make those, those um, communication pushes. And uh, we're trying to address it sort of culturally through the entire event. Um, it's a complicated subject in that um, you know people have strong feelings about it, positively and negatively, and also people that are doing a quote unquote plug and play camp. It's a wild, wide spectrum of people doing it beautifully in a way that's really enhancing our city and making the world a better place to people who don't get it. Um, so we're trying to have those dialogues as many ways as we possibly can, proactively rather than reactively, and really manage it from um, the vendor aspect as they come into our city. There was a question up front here. A couple of people over here on this side. Chris, can you see them there? Yeah. Hi, so um, I'm from Santa Fe, New Mexico, where we have Zosobra. And I just have to know, is there a relationship between Burning Man and Zosobra, or are they just both no. un um, unique events? Not at all. I'd love to go, but you know, it's at the same time. It's as at the, the thing same the time, and it's also very much growing up there. It's like by artists and has the same feeling of New Year's for us who are from there. And a bit counterculture to this idea of the celebration of the reconquest of Santa Fe. So. Well, you know, fire is the one thing that is the essence of bringing community together. Building something and setting on the fire is not really new. <laughs> Chris? The other question we're asked sometimes is whether there's an affiliation with the, the Wicker Man movie. Um, there is a Wicker Man movie, which is actually kind of terrifying to watch. There's two. There's one from like the 50s or something I've seen. It's trippy. Um, but Larry, I think, think, finally saw it recently, but he'd never seen anything like that before when he had idea to, to do the thing on the playa. And he's never been to Zozobra. I think Earl Tarble, are you, are you, is that you? Yeah, okay. There we go. You know, you've developed a city of 70,000 people, and you have a lot of things to, to oversee and the like. Are you guys having any fun like you'd had when you started? <laughs> Great question. Are you <laughs> kidding? <laughs> I, I can tell a story about that. I know Michael has fun. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you a story about that because I'm uh, in my 70th year and I, I semi-retired from Burning Man five years ago. And uh, up until that point, I was always engaged. I knew what to do at Burning Man. I knew I had to work. And there's staff, people to report to me, and there was dealing with the agencies and all of the different things that went on. And I was a part of the cog of that machine. And so then my first year, after I turned 65, I had the absolute worst burning man of my life. And it's because I had my radio and no one was calling me. 
<laughs> and I, I didn't have any meetings to go to, so I didn't know what to do. And I had forgotten in 20 years what Burning Man was all about. And so then this last year, it's been four years now, I had absolutely the best Burning Man of my life. And it's because I became a burner. <laughs> and it was awesome. <laughs> I was going to, uh, yeah, it's been interesting to watch. A role, I, we camp together, and it's been, uh, we all have had different moments where our roles uh, have changed, and then you sort of like, well, am I needed? Am I necessary? Uh, my history was in reverse. I went to Burning Man in 1995 and 1996, so I wasn't an organizer. I didn't have a radio. And I, my boyfriend at the time in 1996, he's able to tell this story. He stayed in first camp one year, and, he, and I remember him sharing it with a couple people. In 1996, I sat there in our little camp. We did a suburbia camp, which was way out on the edge of Black Rock City at the time. And he said I sat there the whole time trying to figure out where I could help. And so I got my drove, my you know, psyche towards it. And I can't imagine attending if I didn't do something. Uh, for much of the staff, the, 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 the enjoyment of uh, Burning Man is, is doing what they do. And there's a kind of an in story that, that I tell uh, about the staff. When you go to Burning Man, you, you, you finally get to join and be a part of the staff. And the one thing you want is that radio, you know, because that radio connects you to everything. And then you go to a higher staff position and you get two radios. You know, so you're monitoring two channels, and you're really busy. And finally, you get three radios. There's one in the middle, left ear, right ear, and the one in the middle. Then, when you back off, you get rid of your radios and just have a pager. Then, when you give up the pager, you're free. <laughs> I just want to um, be really clear that uh, staff means volunteers, because we all know that that city is, made, uh, is run by volunteers. So we're talking about a lot of people. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Yeah. Hi. I've been to Burning Man many times over the years. I think my first one was in 1998, and I, I appreciate everyone being out here. And one of the things I've always loved about being there is the lack of corporate branding that you see in the, in the playa. And I'm wondering if you tell us a little bit more about your, both your philosophy around that and the difficulties you've had enforcing that over the years and the struggles that you've had. Um, decommodification is one of the principles of Burning Man. And as part of that, we try to prevent uh, advertising as such, using the, the Burning Man event as a vehicle for advertising. So uh, we've even encouraged people that rent uh, trucks to modify, change the message, uh, often very hilariously on the side of their rental trucks. Uh, we, we do try to have some policing of that, and there are situations where we've asked people that were blatantly trying to advertise and promote uh, a product from the outside. So we're, we're still engaged in trying to keep branding, commercial branding, uh, out of the event. So Burning Man grew really organically. And um, in the beginning, we didn't know what it was. We really didn't know what it was. But we knew that it was important and it resonated with people. And we knew we need, needed to protect it from certain things on the outside that were going to be really damaging. And, we knew that in some level, maybe not without these, these exact words, that it was a safe place for people and that if you had um, uh, any kind of uh, corporate uh, branding or you had any kind of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, sponsorship coming in, that, that, would, that would start to change the safe space and start to change it into something that's commercialized in some level. So immediately we, we, we kept um, any sort of opportunity to get money from a corporation, you know, any sort of branding out of the event. We've done that forever and ever. Um, and I think it's really been one of the things that, that has anchored us and, and kept us strong through all these years. So it's still very much a part of, of who we are and, and what we believe in, and um, very much we try very hard. Uh, the, the placement team looks through all those questionnaires, and if some, every once in a while, it doesn't happen a lot, but maybe once every two years, you'll find a nonprofit or a for-profit um, calling their theme camp the name of their company, 
And they call them up and say, hey, that's not cool. Or sometimes they slip by for a couple of years and we don't notice, and then somebody comes and tells us. I swear to God, the um, peer pressure is really what keeps this thing going, right? People police for us. And we'll go and have those hard conversations. But generally, oftentimes people just don't know. They just didn't realize. They, didn't, they identify so much with their wonderful thing they're doing out there in the world with their nonprofit that they want to share that with at Burning Man, and they'll bring it. Every once in a while, someone's trying to make money, and it's a harder conversation. But boy, we have... The, we have 70,000 people who have our back on it, so they never win. We're going to take one or two more questions, and then we're going to break. So um, I have one from the okay. educators. Amanda, Lounge. by the way. Yes, it's Amanda. Amanda, I, Amanda, stop. Okay. That's a warning for you to slowly make your way to the front after oh, we do this question. You got it. No okay. worries, Bill. Okay. I am on it. So I am this time relaying a question from one of the educators. Um, and this one pertains, pertains particularly to Fly Ranch. Um, they are wondering, um, you know, Fly Ranch is a special and potentially fragile ecosystem. So in some of the programming that you are looking at uh, for the future of what might take place there, would sustainability and sustainability-focused workshops potentially be a part of the program at Fly Ranch? Uh, absolutely. The list that Michael put up there is Michael's brainstorming. Uh, there is a team, if you go look at the website, is it flyranch.burningman.org, Zach? Zach's right here, if you raise your hand. Um, if while you're here, this uh, next, until the end, um, and you have some deeper questions, you've got all of these guys, Will has been um, spearheading these efforts for years in Crimson, and Michael is, lives in the area, and of course Harley, but Zach and Matt are on the team that are actually doing the brainstorming um, put up the website, talking to the community members and starting to um, organize some walks uh, in the area. And um, y we don't know exactly what's going to happen there, but I know that sustainability is like probably the number one vocabulary word that people bring up, whether it's energy or whether it's um, economy, uh, whether it's uh, animals. Of course, there's wild horses and 80 different kinds of birds there. Um, we are about sustainability of the culture, so of course we're going to be uh, very intent upon the sustainability of the land. I, I think a good example of our good intention is that our first step was to hire a scientist to live on the land for a year. And uh, uh, Dr. Lisa Sheely, who is formerly from the Smithsonian, has now lived on the land for about six months, and she's identifying species of plants and animals. And what we've discovered is that the um, wetlands there is a much more diverse ecosystem than we could have ever imagined. And, and so that, that is now shifting our thoughts uh, on, on what can be done there and what will be done there in the future. And certainly we, 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 we're looking at proposals, but we're not even beginning to sift through those proposals until we're done with the scientific survey. Yeah, my role at Burning Man has always been to really push the boundaries, and I come up with some pretty wild stuff. <laughs> but I'd also like to point out that Fly Ranch has been a cattle ranch for more than 100 years. Uh, the vegetation there has been devastated and shifted. The geyser itself was created by drilling a hole in the ground. Uh, a lot of the wetlands are there because there's a huge dam there that actually creates that. So there, there's some areas that are fragile, but they're, they're man-made to a great extent. So we need to look at that and preserve and actually perhaps enhance that to, 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 to make it more of a viable, wonderful place. Yeah, it's, it's a, it really is interesting. Um, it's a fascinating process that we're going through. There is a lot of actually refuse that's been left behind. Um, they found the drilling cores recently that uh, left back from the 60s. There's some land core. There's like, there's <laughs> abandoned vehicles. It's it's actually there's par parts of a plane. <laughs> Fly Ranch got its uh, name because it was once uh, during the World War One, an airport and a training ground, and there's crashed planes on that place. <laughs> Question. Okay, I think, uh, well, got we've got Matt. one more question. We've got one more question. Well, we've so. got, we got a question. You've got Matt, and you've got this woman who keeps raising her hand. Yeah. I, I think we've exactly. missed her. I did say yes to you. need the mic? Because I got it. I want to ask Will. Here it comes. I'd like to ask Will. 
like to ask Will to explain, give us a short version of your first meeting when you tried to share your vision of Burning Man with the village elders, and then the next year once they had experienced it. Well, they, you, we actually, the, there were some of the Paiutes that came out to Burning Man that then were a lot more interested in what we were doing. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. How did they feel about it? How did they, what did they think about it? Um, it's over a course of time. You know, that's a good question, and it's difficult for me to answer. Um, our cultures are so different. Uh, I'm sure that a little bit of it was um, uh, here white man is doing some absurd thing on our sacred land. Mm. I think part of it was that. Mm. On the other hand, I feel like I represented our, in our good intentions to bring the land back to its um, leave no trace ethos. And I presented that very directly to the elders, and I think that helped them accept us on the land that is truly theirs. So I went into it with that attitude. And, and um, the, contra the contract that we need from the, the Native Americans uh, that are you know, adjacent to where we do the commercial event doesn't have to be too extensive. They don't have to validate or agree with what enterprise is going on. They simply have to say, yeah, it's okay. Okay, so, so it wasn't a real in-depth contract negotiation. Um, I, 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 I don't know, some of it has to do with personalities. You know, they liked me right from the beginning. I don't know why. I think it's because I was honest and forthright about our intention to not trash the, the land and that I myself had a certain sacred feeling towards the land. I've always felt that, so we shared that. Um, they, they, prior to Burning Man, they had some bad experiences at the, um, um, the Pyramid Lake Reservation, so I, I think they had some intrepidation about it. But we were able to work through that really quickly. So, you know, I, I don't know, is, does that answer your question? I... <clears throat> when Burning Man first came to the Black Rock Desert in the 1990s, we would load up all of our trash and debris in the rental trucks to take them to the dump. And not only that, we went further out into the desert and we ranged far and wide. We found car bodies, appliances, refuse. It was a dumping ground. The Black Rock Desert is much cleaner now than it was before Burning Man arrived. Question. Yeah, we have a question way in the back here. Yeah. Hang Burning on. Burning Man makes a lot of money, right? Oh. That's oh, me right okay. here with the hand up. Okay. What do y'all do with the dough? And also like, does, do you contribute the dough back to the cats whose land you're on? When you do the party and all that? I, I can't oh, let me clarify the question. Does Burning Man make a lot of, like, Burning Man makes a lot of money, right? No, no. You don't make no money? But it's expensive to Burning go there. Burning Man is a nonprofit organization, and we pretty much spend everything that comes in. So it's is everything a, free when you go a, there? The whole idea is not to profit from it. Nice. But to create and share an experience. There's, There's no, no vending. vending is allowed. There's no commercial sales of anything there. Amazing. So y'all just show up, and then rock, and then dip. And everybody gives everything away. It's free. Tight. Y'all represent the folks, though? Like the land and all that, you know what I mean? You don't respect that? Uh, the federal government charges Burning Man close to $4 million to rent that place. Nice. It's public land. And then it, it goes that to the That land belongs to, the to all of us. So Burning Man takes out a permit and basically rents that for a period of time. Mm. And it's, it's actually one of the most profitable events for the government. <laughs> so the government is the ones yeah. who are holding the dough. But no, we don't make any money. <laughs> and then what does the government do with the dough? They go on ski trips. Uh, you should ask them. Uh, we'd actually like to know. <laughs> okay. Let's not go. That was the only question I have for you, man. Thank you very much. Cool. All right. All right. With that, I'm going to bring Amanda Horn up. Um, we're going to take a break. I want to hear your announcements. 
and we're going to be back here at four o'clock. So Amanda. Hi. Hi there. Um, yes, and thank you to Bernie Mann.